This episode is brought to you by Paycor, the HR and payroll software made for leaders. It's never been harder to recruit, hire, and engage workers. That's why HR leaders and frontline managers depend on Paycor for all things people management. From onboarding and performance reviews to compensation and benefits. Learn more at paycorecom slash leaders. Today on Something You Should Know, is taking your shoes off before you come into the house really a good idea? Then, trash and recycling. There is so much many of us don't really understand. The messaging on recycling is dreadful, and a lot of the time that's intentional. There are a lot of people out there who actually don't want us to know what happens to our recycling because they're worried that if we know that a lot of this material isn't going to get recycled, that we'll stop bothering. Also, is the honey that you buy at the store really honey? And some radical advice to make keeping your house clean so much easier. Get yourself a full-size trash can, put it in every room. No more of these dinky little bathroom trashes that fill up in half a day and then you, you, know, you avoid it for a week taking it out. Let's get some big trash cans. Let's put them in every room. Put a laundry basket in every room. All this today on Something You Should Know. How would you like to optimize your life in just 10 minutes? You can do it before you fall asleep or even before you start your day. Just listen to a podcast called Optimal Living Daily. It's a simple idea, really. The host of Optimal Living Daily, Justin, is an award-winning audiobook narrator. And so what he does is he gets permission from the most popular online writers and reads their very best articles to you. It's a little bit like an audiobook, but it's a short article every day that will add some inspiration and motivation and positivity to your life and ultimately more happiness. So check it out and subscribe or follow wherever you listen to podcasts. It's called Optimal Living Daily. Something you should know. Fascinating intel. The world's top experts. And practical advice you can use in your life. Today, Something You Should Know with Mike Carruthers. Hi there. Welcome to Something You Should Know. Do you take your shoes off before you come into your house and do you ask other people to do the same? It's estimated that about one third of American households have some sort of no shoe rule that people take off their shoes before they come in. Is it a good idea? Probably so. The fact is that your shoes do drag in dirt that ends up on the floor that you then have to clean. And researchers have found some pretty gross things that come in from shoes that gets deposited on the floors of your home. In addition, your shoes might also pick up allergens, lawn chemicals, and asphalt toxins that can also be tracked into your house. And if you have kids crawling around the floor, that's certainly a concern. But for most healthy adults, the level of contamination on shoes is more of a ick factor than a health threat. It's unlikely that you're going to get ill from wearing your shoes inside your home. Your immune system, including your skin, is highly effective at keeping those bacteria things from making you sick. But there's no real downside, and it can make cleaning your home easier because less dirt is coming in. And that is something you should know. Most of us, I think, have gotten pretty good at separating our recyclables from our trash, from our yard waste, and generally trying to be conscientious and careful about how much waste we generate. But I'm certain you've probably wondered, as I have, does it really make a difference? Does all this separating of things matter? Doesn't it all end up in the landfill anyway, for the most part? Is what we as individuals do really making a difference, or is it more about feeling good, thinking we're doing something? Well, here to explain and discuss this is Oliver Franklin Wallace. He's an award-winning magazine journalist and currently the features editor at British GQ. His writing has appeared in Wired, The Guardian, The New York Times, Men's Health, and many others. He's author of a book called Wasteland, The Dirty Truth About What We Throw Away, Where It Goes, and Why It Matters. Hey, Oliver, welcome to Something You Should Know. Thank you for having me. So let me start by asking what I was just talking about. That is what we do when we're separating our trash and recyclables, 
is it really making a difference? Because I always have this sense that there's kind of a do-goodism factor to this, that it makes people feel like they're doing something, but that it doesn't do much. And in fact, you know, I've even seen uh, trash trucks pick up recyclables. So I assuming it's just getting tossed in the landfill. So I, you just have to wonder, it's a, does it really matter? Absolutely. This is something that I get asked about a lot, actually. And for what, one thing I would say is that absolutely everything you do when it comes to recycling is making a difference. There are some issues with some materials. We can probably talk about plastics later on. But if you take something like an aluminum can, a recycled aluminum can is ninety has a ninety five percent smaller carbon footprint than one that you have to make from virgin materials. So it's ninety five percent better for the planet to uh, to recycle aluminum can. It's about eighty five percent for copper, for example. Uh, it, it's great for paper, great for glass. So there's a bunch of materials that when you're sorting through your recycling, you're doing a great thing. But you're right. There is also a little bit of this, which is you know making us feel better, trying to trying to do something that we think is good for the planet when the truth is a little bit more complicated than that you know we put things in the bin and they they kind of disappear but we're really only the center point of that journey you know often the journey for where our things go is just as long as the journey from where it came so it's a a really fascinating it's been a really fascinating trip to kind of work out where it all is going and often it's not what you think so give me some some facts, some numbers, some sense of the the problem here, how much trash and recycle and how how much is there? How much, where are we putting it? It, it, Just kind of give me some foundation if you could. Sure. So waste is a gigantic problem and and the the numbers quite often blow my mind. Uh, So according to the World Bank, there's about 2.1 billion tons of solid waste produced worldwide every year. Uh, by 2050, that's estimated to be about 3.3 billion tons. So it's growing really quickly. In the US, the average person throws away about 4.4 pounds worth of trash every single day, which is a, you know, a, a really astonishing figure to, when you when you start to think about it. But you know, I could name individual items, 480 billion plastic bottles, over 4 trillion cigarette butts, which are these days made of plastic, by the way, and uh, tend not to biodegrade. And people say, well, okay, well, why is that something that we should care about? It's kind of, we don't see where it goes. It must be going somewhere. We spend a lot of time, you know, thinking about where things come from, but not enough time about where they go. Well, one thing that, that I know I've always wondered about is, you know, for years, decades, we've heard about how the trash that we have somehow ends up killing seagulls or turtles or, you know, and, and I, I never really understood how it gets there, like... How is the plastic pieces that I throw in my trash getting to the beach and killing animals? I, I, can you explain that? This is this is a huge problem, particularly in the global south. You know, the, the poorest countries in the world. We take for granted in countries like America and the UK that you can take your bin out at the end of the day and it will kind of take off and be sorted and disposed of relatively efficiently. But there's about two billion people in the world who don't have formalized formal waste collection. But at the same time, we are selling them the same kind of products. So, you know, they still buy Cokes and they buy all the same luxuries that we do every day. And so the, the, the amount of trash produced is about the same. What else would people be surprised to hear about how trash ends up where it shouldn't end up and how, and how perhaps we're contributing to a problem and, and may not even know it? You know, a lot of people, for example, don't realize you take your old clothes down to the thrift store and donate it. Uh, which is you know is a lovely generous thing to do or so we think but in some cases about 90% of the things that we give to thrift stores that we donate doesn't actually end up resold in those stores in fact most of the time it doesn't end up sold even in the same country it goes to big sorting facilities where it's graded and bagged up and it goes to the developing world uh, so you know your clothes may end up in Afghanistan or Bangladesh or in Central America or in South America and there was some interesting photographs lately that came out of some, a lot of U.S. clothing waste in Chile, for example, in the desert, and supposedly you could see this landfill from space. So it's a huge issue that is a global one. It's, it, like any part of our globalized economy, it's a, a responsibility for all of us to get it right. But there's not much I can do about the waste problem in Afghanistan. and I mean, it may be a global problem, but there's not much I can do. Well... There's a story that really struck me, which is, you know, I followed some donations 
from the UK, uh, secondhand clothing from the, the from the UK to uh, Ghana in West Africa. Now, Ghana, the capital city of Ghana is Accra, and I talked there to, with the the head of the municipal waste department for the city, and the they had one sanitary landfill, and it had been paid for by a loan from the World Bank. Now, Ghana in the last you know, decade or, or two has been flooded with donations, just like a lot of African countries. A lot of the stuff that they get is, is good, but a huge amount of it is also just trash. You know, it's spoiled or it's ripped. It's things that should really be thrown away. And this guy said, well, you know, what happened was that we had this brand new landfill, which is you know, better for the environment and better for the people. And it filled up with all of this secondhand clothing that was coming in. And then one day it caught fire. The landfill burned to the ground. Now, the people of Ghana are still paying off the World Bank loan from that landfill that burned to the ground with, with donations because, you know, a lot of us were donating trash. So that's an example of, you know, what you could do. Make sure that you're not donating things that other people are, you know, if you wouldn't wear something here, then you shouldn't be donating it to the, to the, to the thrift store. Isn't it true, though, that even if you recycled everything you could recycle and not put it in a landfill, th that the result of that would be hardly noticeable. That, in fact, the huge majority of things in landfill is construction and demolition uh, debris, and that is what is filling up landfills, not people's household recyclables that they, they're throwing away instead of recycling. It's definitely true that the construction and, and demolition uh, industries are responsible for a huge amount of waste, you know, particularly by weight. When you think about when you knock down a skyscraper and where all that goes, it's also true that in, in my experience, those industries are tremendously successful at recycling because they you know they count their they count their pennies, and you see a lot of material, for example, that gets ground down and turned into your road road aggregates or into new bricks and things like that. So. Building has historically been a quite sustainable industry when it comes to reusing waste and recycling. And there's lots of other innovations going on in that space that are quite interesting. Obviously, when you pull down a bunch of drywall and it's full of asbestos and things, that's going to go in a landfill, a toxic uh, waste landfill, and that's that's the best thing for it. Let's let's not let's not pretend that landfill isn't a practical solution for a lot of this waste. But even if we you know were to take away that side, we're still talking about huge amounts of the waste. I mean, you should see, you go down to one of these material uh, recovery facilities, these places where they pick through the things that we throw in the trash and that companies throw in the trash every day. It is mind-blowing. The number of, you know, the Amazon boxes that kind of uh, are streaming down these in gigantic conveyor belts. Or I went to an electronics recycling facility in Fresno in California, and you see the numbers of like brand new TVs sometimes being put into these gigantic you know, blenders, essentially, to be separated for the raw materials. So I think it's a, a mistake to think that, you know, this the industrial waste is in the entire problem, and that demolition waste is the entire problem. We're talking about trash and recyclables and how much it helps. And my guest is Oliver Franklin Wallace. He's author of the book Wasteland, the dirty truth about what we throw away, where it goes, and why it matters. Between the kids being home and hosting, everything in our house gets used up in summer. With Instacart, I can save money by stocking up on all my favorite summer brands. I save time by getting everything delivered in as fast as an hour. And I save myself a sink full of dirty dishes by stocking up on paper plates for the annual summer cookout. Save more on summer essentials? Spend more time enjoying summer. Add summer to cart. Download the app to get free delivery on your first three orders. Offer valid for a limited time. Minimum $10 per order. Additional terms apply. This episode is brought to you by Paycor. Paycor empowers leaders to build winning teams. With Paycor, leaders can recruit, onboard and train employees, set goals, and drive performance. If you're a leader, everyone depends on you. Who do leaders depend on? Paycor. Learn more at paycor.com slash leaders. So Oliver, when it comes to recycling, there has to be an end user to that. And as I recall, China used to buy a lot of our recyclables and they stopped. And so uh, I've also heard that a lot of the stuff that we put in our recycle bin thinking we're recycling, it ends up in a landfill anyway, because there's no buyer. Between 1988 and 2018, when they shut its doors, China 
imported about 50% of all the exported plastic waste worldwide. So when they shut, I mean, that was the impetus for me going on this journey is, was was hearing about that and the absolute chaos it caused through the global um, materials markets because all of a sudden, you know, the, the, all of the waste had, had, had somewhere to go. So you, you're right, like a, a lot of the materials that we separate, but particularly when it comes to plastics, a lot of those things will not be recycled. Uh, it, it depends a lot of the time on, on where you are, the kind of collection and sorting and those kind of things. But yeah, you're right. There are a lot of plastics that aren't recyclable or are much less recyclable than we've been led to believe. There are a lot of materials that, you know, there, there just isn't a demand for or the demand is you know, halfway across the world somewhere. A bigger issue for me that, that I think is not realized by most people is that, you know, plastic is not... Uh, infinitely recyclable plastic degrades and every time you recycle it it goes through the system it picks up these little imperfections and chemical contaminants and things and so you get what's called down cycling so you you know your pepsi bottle is not going to be turned into a pepsi bottle most of the time it may be that turn gets turned into yarn and then it gets turned into a t-shirt and or a soccer shirt and then maybe that soccer shirt gets turned into you know, whatever, and then eventually it ends up as some drain pipe because they get darker and darker and more brittle as it goes along. So you're right to say that recycling plastics, in a lot of cases, is not happening. And we need to, I think, reckon with the realities there. There is a, at the same time, there's been a huge explosion in demand for recycled plastic all around the world. You know, big companies, your Nikes and your Adidas and your, you know, Coca-Colas, now, because of the pressure by consumers, are desperately looking for recycled material to put into their products. And it's it was really interesting to me talking to people in the trade who said that a few years ago they had to sell recycled plastics at a loss. You know, they they kind of saw it as something they wrote off. They did it sometimes it's for tax benefits, but largely it was just to kind of use up the capacity in the system. These days, recycled you know a recycled Coke bottle sells at a at a, at a huge markup, and in a lot of ways, there's not enough in the system. There is more demand now than we can meet. By calling out these issues and by becoming aware of it, it's really helped us drive growth. And a lot of that is driven by changes in consumer behavior and people demanding more recyclable uh, material in their products. I was surprised to learn because I think people are anxious to do whatever it is they can do to help this problem. But there's a lot of things that people don't know. For example, and I learned this from, uh, I guess, from another interview about this, but for example, that, you know, people recycle cardboard, like pizza boxes and stuff. Well, if there's grease on it, it can't be recycled. So, and, and if the cardboard gets wet, even if it's dried out after it's been wet, it can't be recycled. That there's a lot of things like that, that like when you put recyclables in an opaque bag, no one's going to open it. It just goes to the landfill, even though it could be full of recycles, recyclables. That people don't know that. And if they knew that, they would do a better job of it. But nobody ever tells anybody, here's how we need you to do this. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. The messaging on recycling is dreadful. And a lot of the time that's intentional. You know, if you look at a lot of materials, and this is certainly true in, in the UK and Europe, but I'm, I'm pretty sure is is equally true in the US, we have all sorts of conflicting labels and messaging. And you see these little dots and you, people say to me, well, oh, I thought that meant it was recycled. Well, it doesn't. Oh, I thought that meant it's recyclable. Well, it doesn't. A lot of the time, these logos don't mean anything to do with that. They mean, oh, the company's paid some money into a recycling scheme somewhere in Germany or these completely opaque systems and the recycling the packaging industry has known by the way for years that many of these labels confuse people but they also make people feel good about buying stuff so they tend to leave the labels on there and uh, i think there are a lot of people out there who actually probably don't want us to know how uh, what happens to our recycling because they're worried that if we if we know that a lot of this material isn't going to get recycled that we'll stop bothering now that's the wrong answer to this this question. You know, I don't think we need to give up on recycling at all. I actually think the opposite. I think we need more recycling. We need better recycling. You know, you gave the example of cardboard boxes, pizza boxes. Now, it, it is true that in some cases, uh, if your cardboard pizza box is incredibly soiled and greasy, 
you know, they don't want to take that. That's not going to recycle well. The grease comes out in the in the vats when it goes to the recycling plant. But in a lot of cases, you know, you just need to tear a little bit out and you can still stick in the recycling. And it's fine. They don't, it doesn't need to be the same shape or whatever, what have you. The thing about it getting wet, well, this depends on where you are. In the UK, which is a relatively small country, you know, compared to the US, we have... In some cases, I think they call it box to box in 14 days. And when I went to a, a, a huge, the, probably the biggest um, card and paper recycling factory in the UK, they, well, they said, well, we don't really care uh, if it's if it's a little bit degraded, is a little bit dirty because it doesn't have time to sit in the sun and go moldy and degrade. So, the, you know, over here, they're not that, that bothered about that stuff. Now, if it's soaking wet and it's sitting out in the California sunshine for a month bef- in, in some yard somewhere, that might be a different thing. A lot of this system is really dependent on where you live. So it's really about kind of working out what's right for you, what your system is is like, whether it's actually any good. It requires a little bit of digging some cases into your local system and quite often demanding better because, you know, as I said, there's a tremendous demand for this stuff out there. You know, there, there, these companies, there are billion dollar companies out there hoovering up our waste and selling it on and they can't get enough of it. So, uh I don't think the solution is to to kind of be defeatist. I think the solution is to kind of demand better uh, from our from our waste. What's an example of th- something going on in the the waste or the the recycling business that confuses people or that that people think is a good thing maybe that isn't so great or anything like that? There's, a, there's been this trend re- uh, recently for companies marketing recycled out of ocean plastic, for example. Now, ocean plastic or recovered ocean plastic, as they, they sometimes brand it, you know, you tell people oh, it's made from ocean plastic. It must have been fished out of the ocean. That's not true at all. Actually, if you look at the fine print, what, what the industry defines as ocean plastic is any plastic collected in a developing country within 50 kilometers of an ocean or major river, <laughs> which is a gigantic <laughs> part of the world, you know. Billions of people live within that d- definition. And so when you actually look a little bit closer, what that means often is that these are some of the very poorest people in the world picking up trash off beaches and off riversides in the Philippines or whatever, or Thailand or wherever that may be, and selling them for a tiny fraction. You know, I'm talking about cents. And then they get hoovered up into this giant system. And, and as, as a result, you know, a big sportswear company can t- sell you a, a, a football shirt uh, made out of ocean plastic or whatever that might be, so I think it's important. You know, again, I don't, don't I don't want to uh, put people off because uh, I think it's tremendously important that we clean up the oceans from all the stuff we put in it. But it's really important that we see the reality behind a lot of these systems. Well, this has been very in- enlightening and informative about you know about what happens to what we throw away or recycle or if it gets recycled and. It's interesting to hear the intricacies of all this because most of us just don't know. I've been talking to Oliver Franklin Wallace. He is an award-winning journalist and author of the book Wasteland, The Dirty Truth About What We Throw Away, Where It Goes, and Why It Matters. And there's a link to that book in the show notes. Thanks, Oliver. Thanks, Mike. This has been great. Thanks for having me. Are you currently enjoying the show on the Stitcher app? Then... You need to know Stitcher is going away on August 29th. Yep, going away, as in kaput, gone, dead. Rest in peace, Stitcher, and thanks for 15 years of service to the podcast community. So switch to another podcast app and follow this show there. Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen. I'm one of those people who's fascinated by design. Like I look at things and think, well, why was it designed this way? Design is everywhere in our lives, perhaps most importantly, in those places where we've stopped noticing it. It's why I like the podcast 99% Invisible. It's a weekly exploration of the process and power of design and architecture. The host, Roman Mars, asks questions like, why do we use the bleep sound to cover up inappropriate words on radio and TV? And what's with mall culture? And how did the mall become a ubiquitous part of American life? And why are houseplants having a moment right now? All of that gets answered on the podcast 99% Invisible, every Tuesday. Follow and listen to 99% Invisible, wherever you get your podcasts. 
So here's something I know about you. You have a job, this particular job, and you work at it at least a little bit every day. And it seems like it's never done. And it's likely not one of your favorite things to do. And yet, there it is. And what is it? It's keeping your house clean and organized. Now, I, you might be thinking, well, wait, do I really want to listen to a segment about house cleaning? Well, actually, yeah, this one you do. See, you haven't met my guest yet, so let's meet her. Casey Davis. She is author of a book called How to Keep House While Drowning. She is a therapist and very visible on social media. In fact, across the various social media platforms, she has more than one and a half million followers. She's been featured in the Washington Post, Oprah Daily, Slate, and she is here today. Hi, Casey. Welcome to Something You Should Know. Hi. Thank you for having me. So no one escapes housework and everybody worries about, you know, keeping their house clean. And you have this unique approach. I, I, maybe it's a philosophy. So let's start there. Explain your view on cleaning and organizing. Well, the shift really starts with this perspective shift where we stop looking at housework as external tasks that measure whether we're doing good enough or whether we are good enough as people and kind of looking at them instead as just these morally neutral tasks, which means that doing good at them doesn't make you a good person and bad at them doesn't make you a failure. And there's no such thing as laziness. They're, they're literally just tasks that we engage in to care for ourselves. And that helps us sort of get out of this mindset of shame where we feel like we're failing if we're not on top of everything and really just breaking it down to, it doesn't matter what the invisible audience in my head would think. It matters whether my space is functional. Yeah. But, but also that there is that years and years of conditioning, perhaps that many of us got that, you know, uh, you should be organized, you should be tidy, things should be clean, everything should be in its place. And, and you can try to mitigate that a little bit in your head. But at the end of the day, when you walk into a room that isn't neat and tidy, you notice that. Yeah, that's why I always say that the first skill we have to work on or embrace before we talk about the skills of cleaning or the skills of organizing is really the skill of self-compassion. You know, these messages don't go away overnight, but it's helpful when we walk into that room and we see that mess and we hear those messages to first just kind of stop and recognize that that we are hearing those. They're coming from somewhere. That's not just truth being imparted to you. And sometimes it's even helpful to kind of stop and say, whose voice is that? Really, whose voice is that? Because we can often trace it back to a specific person in our lives that was really critical. And when we realize that mess doesn't have inherent meaning, it doesn't mean that we automatically feel great about everything. But we can start that process of sort of stopping becoming aware of the messages, and then making a conscious choice to just get curious. Like, what else could my mess mean? Could it mean that I was spending time with loved ones today and I'm prioritizing that? Could it mean that I'm just having a hard time and people that are having a hard time deserve compassion? There is a perception, I think, that people are either neat or, or messy. And I don't see it that way. I, to me, it's more of a scale. I'm not on either end of those I'm not overly neat. I'm not overly messy. I'm somewhere in the middle. And I think a lot of people are somewhere in the middle. But it is interesting to me anyway, that, that people who are really neat get so upset w when they see a mess, when it, like it really bothers them. Yeah. And it kind of depends on even in that moment, like different people could be hating that for different reasons, right? Because sometimes you walk in and there's a difference between if there's any visual clutter, I have anxiety versus when you walk in and you see a mess and what, what is overwhelming about it is, okay, I'm going to have to clean that part of it. And I think a lot of mothers and wives resonate with that. It's like, okay, the thing about the mess that can be frustrating to come into is this idea that I'm going to be the one to have to clean this up later. And you're right. There is a scale. And I also think that we tend to think that things like clean, tidy, and organized are all the same thing, and they're actually very different. So cleaning is like removing dirt and grime and debris from your home, whereas organizing means that everything in your home has a place. 
and you remember where those places are and it's functionally, you know, pretty easy for you to get things when you need them. But tidy is putting things back quickly. So you can actually be a person who is organized. Everything in your home has a place, but you're messy, meaning you don't return things back to that place quickly. I mean, you you kind of leave it out and then maybe you come back a couple of days later and do a, you know, a full scale swoop of your whole house putting things back to where they are. And so sometimes people are messy because they're unorganized. They they're struggling to find places for their things, but sometimes they just messy. Maybe they have ADHD, maybe they're a creative person, maybe they're overwhelmed, maybe that's just their personality. And so I think sometimes when you are a messy person, you assume that means that you're not a clean person, you're not an organized person. And it can be helpful to distinguish those things because becoming organized is the best thing you can do for yourself as a messy person. You don't have to stop being messy, but your life will get so much easier if you can get some organization. Okay, so now let's assume that people do want to get a handle on things better. What is your approach to organizing and cleaning the house that's different than perhaps we've heard before? What is your your philosophy here? The first thing we do is give ourselves radical permission to get curious. What is it about the dishes that feels like such a block? Is it that I'm the one that does dishes every day and I'm tired? Is it that I walk away and I forget the dish? Is it that when I look at a pile of dishes in the sink, I feel like it's going to take me so long? Is it a sensory issue? I don't like when my clothes get wet. I don't like putting my hands into food that's kind of soggy. You have to kind of give yourself permission to really ask yourself what the barrier is without worrying about someone going, well, that's just stupid. Just do it anyways. Because when you identify what the barrier is, you can find ways to to adapt your environment to make that task more accessible to you. So let me give you some examples. I realized that having dishes all around my house was not functional. And the first thing I did was say, okay, I want a one step change. And I finally got myself a dish rack and I put a dish rack up and I said, this is my dirty dish rack. Because what I did know is that when I look at a sink full of dishes, it's overwhelming. But when I organized those dishes on the counter, all of a sudden it didn't feel as overwhelming anymore. And so I thought, well, what if when I when I got done with a dish, I just stuck it, I just rinsed it and stuck it right onto a dish rack. And then at the end of the day, I could load my dishwasher and they, if things would be rinsed and they'd be organized and it wouldn't feel overwhelming. I wouldn't feel like I wanted to avoid it. So that's one example. Yeah, see, I think most people think the reason they don't want to do the dishes is they just don't want to do the dishes. And the, the, mm-hmm. and you know, and maybe that is the reason. I mean, I think that is the reason often why I don't do the dishes, because I, I don't mind getting wet. I don't mind touching gooey food. I just, just don't want to do the dishes. Yeah. So as people, let's say we take laundry, for example, for the longest time, um, like I would get it into the washer, I would get it into the dryer, and then it would just sort of like lay on a pile because folding clothes, and I kind of woke up one day and realized like, why am I folding baby onesies? Like truly, I don't need to fold athletic shorts or fleece pajamas or like all of these clothes that I had been folding just because I thought, well, that's what you do. And what I ended up doing was creating a family closet because that was the other part. It's like, why am I going to three different closets to dress three different people? I'm the one dressing, I'm dressing myself, I'm dressing my one-year-old, I'm dressing my three-year-old. So I really should just put all of their clothes in my closet so that we can all go to one place. Every All the clothes that come off go into one basket right there. I can get everybody dressed and then we can go. And then I also decided, okay, I'm instead of making myself fold, because I've been trying to do that for months and I just avoid it, what if I just didn't fold? What if I just put it away, organized? What if I had a basket for all of the underwear and a basket for all of the shorts and a basket for all the shirts And then everyone goes, well, but your clothes will be wrinkled. And I always say, well, yes, Jessica, but they were wrinkled before. They were wrinkled on the floor before. And now at least they're wrinkled and organized and I can get to them easily. And it's it's all about these like small degrees of functional improvements. And it feels like, well, why would you do this? Why wouldn't you just make yourself do it? And I I like to remind people that there are people that get paid like six figures to shave two seconds off of like Amazon's production time. Like these people exist, right? And they're shaving two seconds here and two seconds here. And if we move this to the left side instead of the right side, it'll be this perfect system. 
it's okay to do that in your home. It's okay to say, actually, if I don't fold, that saves me five minutes. I, I listen to you talk and it makes all the sense in the world. Like, why are you folding onesies? But I know people that wouldn't be able to sleep at night knowing the drawer was full of unfolded onesies. Sure. And what I always say to that is like, if you like it, if you prefer it, do it. But if you find yourself in a place where you're not able emotionally, mentally, to prioritize the things that matter more than laundry because you can't sleep at night about the onesies, what I would say to somebody is that it sounds like you're experiencing some anxiety and you deserve better coping skills than having to keep a perfect house. So what what are some other... I, I mean, I like these ideas of like, you know, why, why do you have to fold things that don't need folding and all that? But what, so what else? Do, let's walk around the house and other, other ways we can shortcut and stop overdoing it and maybe ease up. Oh, it's my favorite subject, as you can tell. So one thing that I tell people that might be struggling a little bit is get yourself a full size trash can, put it in every room. No more of these dinky little bathroom trashes that fill up in half a day and then you, you know, you avoid it for a week taking it out. Let's get some big trash cans. Let's put them in every room. Let's get yourself a laundry basket. Put a laundry basket in every room. You know, if you find a place where you tend to pile up clothes, maybe that one chair in your living room, instead of coming up with this big, huge, from now on, I will walk every piece of laundry down to the laundry room and put it direct. No, what it, just see what you're already doing and see if there are small changes we can make. Put a basket next to that chair. I have it in my home so that anytime someone creates a piece of trash or takes off a piece of clothing, they can get those items into a waste basket or a laundry basket within three steps. And that is going to eliminate a lot of clutter, a lot of mess right there, just your trash and your laundry. I think also giving yourself permission to make some shortcuts when you're really going through a difficult time. Um, I am a big fan of telling people that are sick or postpartum or disabled or in grief that they need to be using paper plates. If you feel bad about the environment, you can, you can uh, spend a little more for the compostable ones. Uh, but the truth is that sometimes you need to be using paper plates. Like if you have wept about your dishes in the past two months, you need to be going to paper plates, at least until you are to a functioning place where you can switch back to your regular plates. So those are kind of some things I do around the house. I also create routines that are a little more adaptable to the way that my brain works. So I have ADHD. It's difficult for me to clean as I go because I can't shift attention like that. It's difficult for me to just like look at a big messy room and just start because of time management issues and task initiation issues. But I find that if I look at a big messy room and I tell myself, you know, it seems like there are thousands of things in this room, but actually there's only five, right? There's trash, dishes, laundry, things with a place and things without a place. And I just go from the top. Like I can carry around a trash bag and pick up all the trash and I can carry around a laundry basket and get all the laundry. And I can get all of the dishes and cups that might have been left out throughout the day. And then I can go counterclockwise and put things away that have an easy place. And at the end of the day, the part that can be really difficult about picking up is the decision fatigue about like, oh, here's this thing and I don't know where it goes and I have to figure out where it goes and I have to walk to another room to put it away. And on the way, I'm going to realize three tasks that I should be doing and I'm going to get distracted and I'm going to get sidetracked. And creating these little systems and these little rituals where, you know what, I just go from top to bottom. I go trash, dishes, laundry. And maybe you do that every night in your kitchen and it takes you 15 minutes. You know, we don't have to make everything perfect all the time, but we can make these little shortcuts to make things functional. If you have a, a sink full of dishes and you've just had a day, your options are not just do them or don't. Because there is an option where you pull out your coffee cup and your plate and your silverware, and you wash that and you go, you know what, I may not have it in me to do the dishes tonight, but I deserve a clean plate and a clean coffee cup tomorrow morning. Well, I, I love your solutions because there's like so obvious, like who doesn't have one of those little tiny trash cans in the bathroom that you just hate it because it's so tiny. Well, get rid of it and get a big one. Why not? What other things like that, that like are really like you giving permission to people to try something different that works. Yeah. And I think sometimes we have physical things going on as we get older or if we're struggling. And, and so like some things that I've done for myself, even though 
for the most part, I'm pretty able-bodied. I bought myself like a grabber. So I mean, I have two little kids. They're always stuff all over the floor. And I realized when I got curious and I gave myself that radical permission to what is my resistance to picking up at the end of the night? And I realized it's the bending over. It's just so miserable to bend over, over and over and over and pick every little thing off the floor. And when I finally admitted that to myself, I went, well, you know, they have grabbers for $10 and now I have a little grabber. And I just walk around, don't have to bend over. I pick up everything off the floor with my little grabber. Same thing with in my laundry area. Like I bought myself a rolling stool so that I could put things away without standing up and bending over and standing up and kneeling down and sitting on the floor and just making little things like that easier for myself. I find myself less resistant to doing the task when it comes time to do it. And that leads to the task being done more often. That leads to a more functional house. That leads to more motivation. It's kind of, that's, it is that kind of motivation is a compounding thing. And it leads to just an overall better system for my home. You know, it's funny. We, I was just thinking the other day in our bathroom, in all of our bathrooms, we have these little tiny trash cans and they, and, and they fill up <laughs> like in no time. And then you have to, you, you push the stuff down or you have to empty it. And it, it's like, why do we have little tiny trash cans? Yeah. But, but nobody ever questions that. It's just that, well, that's what you do in the bath. You have little ones. You don't have big ones. Well, well, well it says who? That's exactly what it's about. It's just questioning it. We have a two-story house. We don't have any clothes upstairs. All the clothes are in the downstairs closet because I have little kids right now. So that's where everyone goes. They go in there. They take their clothes off. It goes into a hamper. They put their clothes on. So I don't have, I, they don't need their closets. They're three and five. They don't dress, you know, like I'm still doing their laundry for them. So now we have all these closets. Now, well, now I have a bunch of extra closet space to put things to get more organized. I think often people put off doing things because of the perceived time it's going to take. It's going to take too much time to do this, so I'd rather not do it at all. You know, we've all experienced this. We avoid something and then we do it and we're like, well, I feel silly. That took three minutes or that took five minutes. And so utilizing timers... Um, is really helpful for you, regardless of what end of the spectrum you are, right? If you're somebody who looks at a big room or you look at a pile of dishes and you go, oh, it's so hard to make myself get up. If we think to ourselves, okay, but what if I got up for five minutes? And all of a sudden it's like, oh, okay, I could handle that. Like our brain is trained to avoid pain and to push back on things we think are going to be distressing or painful. And so if we sort of negotiate with our brain on, well, let's do it for five minutes. And our brain goes, oh, it doesn't seem all that painful. And we go do it. And the key is you really do give yourself permission to stop after five minutes. And I think most of the time I find that once I've started, it's easier to keep going and I often just do it all. And then occasionally there are times where I go, no, I really am tired tonight. I really am stressed tonight. I am gonna stop after five. And so that helps people that feel overwhelmed by that. It also helps people that are struggling with perfection. If, if every time you go into your kitchen, you know, you can't stop until the whole thing sparkles, saying, I'm going to make it a habit to go into my kitchen for 15 minutes. And when the timer goes off, I'll be done. And I'll just prioritize the things that matter tonight. And then I'll go spend time with my family. There's another piece of this puzzle we haven't really talked about. And that is, you often hear the criticism of, you know, people have too much stuff. And one of the reasons things are messy and cluttered is there's just too much stuff to keep neat and uncluttered and that, you know, the minimalist approach is a better approach. Use, use what, have what you need and use that, but you don't need all this other stuff to which you say what? For some people, that is definitely the case. And I think that where we kind of get into an area that, that is problematic with minimalism is that I think that we failed to realize how much privilege it takes to be able to own only a few things. Because what people will say when you listen to people who are minimalist and you'll say, well, how do I decide what to get rid of? And there's often this sort of old adage that says, well, if you can replace it for $20 or in 20 minutes, get rid of it. But not everybody has $20 to go out and repurchase something just because they didn't use it for a year. Um, you have people who maybe are on certain medications or have certain health issues where their weight is constantly fluctuating. So they have to keep small sizes of clothes and large sizes of clothes and medium sizes of clothes. Uh, you have, so there's this kind of idea that, well, if we could just get rid of all of it, it would be easier. 
And for some people that may be the case, but it's also just not realistic for a lot of people. I like to call myself a functional maximalist. Um, I like owning a kitchen appliance that does one thing because the one time a year that I make that thing, it makes me happy. I like my things. I like having a home that looks like there are things there. I like that feeling of, oh, look at a lifetime's worth of living. I like that. And it's okay to like that. And so I think you can be true to your own temperament and your own preferences and not feel as though minimalism is somehow morally superior. That's kind of the big deal. Do it if you like it. And if you don't like it or it's not realistic, then you can still find ways to have a really functional home, even if you don't go minimalist. You know, I think so many people clean their house because that's the way they were taught to clean the house, or that's the way they observed their parents clean the house without ever questioning it. And I love how you, you've you made it possible for people to say, well, wait a minute, maybe there's a better way. Maybe there's a shortcut. Maybe there's a different way to approach the whole thing. I've been speaking with Casey Davis. She's author of a book called How to Keep House While Drowning. And there is a link to that book at Amazon in the show notes. Thanks for coming on, Casey. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. You're a great interviewer. Did you know that a lot of the honey sold in grocery stores and big box stores isn't actually honey? In order for honey to be honey, it has to have pollen in there. And manufacturers go to great lengths to remove the healthy pollen because it makes the honey look prettier and also makes it impossible to detect the country of origin. According to Dr. Ronald Fessenden, who's a honey expert and author of a book called The Honey Revolution, honey without pollen is pointless. It's missing all the good stuff, amino acids, antioxidants, and other healthy compounds. To be sure you're getting real honey, look for honey that is labeled raw and unfiltered. It will probably look cloudy and start to crystallize. And that's okay, because real honey lasts forever. Store it in a glass container at room temperature, soak it in warm water to dissolve the crystals, and everything should be fine. And you probably don't want to microwave honey that will compromise the quality. And that is something you should know. It would help us if you would help spread the word about this podcast. Tell someone you know, maybe a couple of people, and ask them to listen. I'm Mike Carruthers. Thanks for listening today to Something You Should Know.